Welcome to Abbotsbury Gardens on this rather beautiful sunny morning, quite chilly in May, but um, we've still got lots of colour, lots of interesting things for people to see when we're getting ready to open in a few weeks time, hopefully. Um, and this morning I'm going to try and show you some of the more interesting plants that you will discover when you're walking around um, this garden at the moment because we've had our first flush of flowers, all the rhododendrons and the magnolias, they've all done their bit, but we're now coming into the earlier summer plants coming out and there's lots of interesting things from Madeira to look at and also the early azaleas from China, um, fantastic colours down in the valley, so we'll, we'll move on down the valley soon and have a look at it. Meanwhile, I'm going to feed the fish first thing in the morning. They love their little breakfast and um, put a few pellets out just to keep them happy. Quite hungry this morning. But it is only five degrees when I came in first of all, so it's warming up a little bit, but it, it's quite a chilly north wind, so it's uh, really cutting across the garden today. that so this is one of the um, Madeira plants I've seen in the wild on several trips when I've been to Madeira and this one is an Echium, Echium nervosum and it grows quite near the coast but quite special very sort of large dumpy flowers but beautiful viridescent blue lovely colours and the bees absolutely love them but of course you'll see the other Echiums around the garden the big tall towering spiky ones that's Echium pininiana which we'll see in a second but this one nervosum is quite unusual how about this for a flower spike this is quite spectacular this is um Bechoneria. it looks a bit like a yucca with the big spiky leaves uh Bechoneria yuccoides but look at that flower trying to describe what the flower looks like, almost orchid-like. So here we have the, uh, the Echium pininiana, actually massive flower. This one's slightly more whiter than the other ones. Um, these are actually uh, native to the Canary Islands, but a lot of people often see them flowering by the coast because they are kind of um, coastal, where they're a bit more protected, a bit milder climate, and they, they seem to come through the winters better. Um, they tend to be biannual, so they'll grow for a year, put this giant flower spike out um, and then set lots of seeds and then it tends to die after that, but quite a spectacular plant. Okay, this looks um, almost a familiar plant to many people. It's almost like our cow parsley. But this is the giant black parsley. Um, it comes from Madeira up in the mountains of the Laurel Silver Forests. And it's a biannual again, it grows for a year and then flowers and then dies, but quite a bold structure, real nice architectural plant. And um, we tend to grow them and dot them all around the woodland valley because they're quite shade tolerant. And they make a big sort of statement in the, in the back of the garden. This is, um, Another beautiful plant from Madeira. It looks like common old daisy to most people, but um, this grows in the Laurel Silver forests and out on rocky outcrops, high up in the high elevations of the mountains of Madeira. And um, it's got quite a large leaf with it. But what I like about it is that it grows in quite shady conditions. And that's the thing you're trying to find in a woodland garden. Um, so here we are, it's quite happy underneath the big canopy of the home oak trees dappled light coming through and it flowers for several months which is good value I think for a plant. Well we're passing, we're in the secret walk at the moment and before you get to this plant the scent is overpowering, it's fantastic. It's actually Rhododendron Fragrantissimum, which is a hybrid that was bred back in the 19th century, but it's been around a long time, but it's slightly tender, but uh, here in the Woodland Valley, it's just, just a perfect place for its shelter. 
And uh, believe me, if you can have smell of vision, it's quite incredible, really, pretty powerful. Very sweet. As we're still talking about Madeiran species of plants, this is a, one of my favorite ferns. It's called Woodwardia radicans. Giant, great big fronds on it. And uh, up in the mountains of the Laurel Silver Forest, it's actually called the chain fern. The reason it's called the chain fern is, and here's the secret, on the very tips of these leaves, as it matures, it produces a rooting nodule here, big hairy, crusty area there, like a rhizome. And then as the plant lowers itself to the ground, that then starts to grow, puts down roots. And then from that, as a new plant, then that grows out again and so on. And then you have a whole area of the forest floor, all linked ferns together. And you can walk through it, be tripping over. So it's like a chain link. But uh, having said that, it just really is a very magnificent plant for woodland garden. And uh, we've been growing it for quite a few years now and we've making the advantage of using these rooting nodules by propagating it and spreading it around the garden. This area here, as you come down the valley, you can see lots more azaleas flowering in May. Um, there's a whole range of colours, shades, uh, and some of these here are Exbury hybrids. These were bred by Lionel Rothschild, who is famous garden in Exbury in the New Forest. And he did a lot of hybrid hybridisation and crossbreeding to get these fantastic colours. And another group of plants are the Knapp Hill azaleas. This is one of them. And they really are stunning colours. And Knapp Hill is... Uh, in Surrey, where the famous Waterers Nursery back in the 19th century started propagating these fantastic azaleas. Um, and there were whole ranges of crossbred colours and, and uh, various shades of pinks and oranges and yellows. This one's called Homebush. I love the way the sun reflects off of this area. I'll just mention this one here. This is, we've got um, quite a few viburnums in the garden. And this is at its best this time of year. It's Viburnum opulus uh, roseum. But it's uh, a common name. You should be able to guess what its common name is. Snowball tree. This is a range of Rhododendron Yakushiminum hybrids. Again, I believe the first seed was brought in or imported from Japan by Lionel Rothschild, and there's all sorts of cross breeding been going on, um, ranging from white pink to this almost salmon pink flower here. And they are quite nice in terms of size. They don't get too big, so they're quite good for the smaller gardens. It's about as big as they'll get. And one of the later flowering rhododendrons, I would say, this is um, Rhododendron Loader's White, quite spectacular loader eye form. Another Yakushi Mine and Rhododendron. This cultivar, they, I believe, is called Sneezy. They did name a whole range of them after seven dwarfs, so you find happy somewhere and there's a few others in the valley. Um,
This is this is quite new for us. This is a cornus hybrid ruticarensis called Celestial. It's actually the um, first time I've seen it flowering, so I'm quite pleased with that. It's on quite a small tree. But as it gets mature, this tree is going to be really spectacular. The whole canopy could be up to 20, 30 feet tall. It's actually a flowering dogwood. Beautiful flowers. Um, and there's a whole range of them. We have Cornus capitata in the valley, which is not flowering just yet. So this is one of the first to flower. And um, quite spectacular. I like calling uh, the flowering dogwoods. How do I identify a flowering dogwood? By its bark. Oh God, sorry about that. One more rhododendron worth mentioning. Uh, this is actually often regarded as a thug because this is rhododendron ponticum. Um, it's the one that's bec become invasive in parts of the, the mountainous areas of Ireland and Wales and they kind of get rid of it. But in the garden here, it seems to be staying fairly stable. It's not self-seeding or anything, so maybe it's a better clone, I don't know. But it's very attractive this time of year and still lots of it to be seen in the gardens. But of course it was used for breeding purposes. And So as, as we're passing through, we notice this, this amazingly tall plant here. Um, this is Solanum lacinatum. It's uh, a plant, it's actually from Australia. It's called kangaroo paw. And it actually acts, it's really a weed here. It pops up in odd places around the garden. But it's an exotic weed because not, not many people can grow it. It can be killed off by frost. But there's a familiarity to it. If you look at the flowers, you go, ah, seen that before somewhere. But in Solanum, it's in the potato family. So you might recognize if your flowers appear on the potatoes, it's very similar to this. Uh, but this is actually quite poisonous in, in its form. Um, the, the seeds or parts of the plant, I believe, have been used in the process of steroids in the process again for making contraceptives so it, many plants have purposes especially in, in sort of uh, research so it ha has its uses but it's poisonous to eat if it produces these big kind of um, yellow egg shaped fruit on it later in the year but quite attractive but this one probably get cut back a bit later on in the year when it gets too big by the path This time of year, the primulas are flowering nicely. Love the damp moisture of this ditch here. Primula pulvirulenta from China. Luckily it self seeds, so it pops up in different places around the garden here. And here we are in our, what we might call a gunnera glade. By the height of the midsummer, these leaves are almost touching. It's like a giant archway and you walk through a tunnel. Quite spectacular. Many years ago, we had a BBC filming production here called Bitsa, and the actors were dressed up as insects and they were walking through these giant leaves to bring the scale into proportion. Um, but they, they are quite a special plant. They love the damp, boggy, wet ground around the stream here. Magnificent leaves, interesting flower spikes, very prehistoric. Um, they're native to Brazil, which is, uh, you know, slightly more exotic place to think about where these come from. But every plant here in the garden has a native home somewhere. And uh, we have to do a lot of research when we're planting. I like to find out their habitat, where they like to grow naturally, whether it's high altitude or in mountainous conditions or damp. So we can replicate the conditions in the gardens here. Always plant in the right place. Uh, that's the secret of getting these plants to establish.
As I mentioned earlier um, about wood wardia radicans, big leaves, this is the second one with big leaves I know in the garden, quite spectacular. It's called Lophosauria and uh, back in 2005 I was lucky enough to go on a plant hunting expedition to Chile with four other head gardeners where we uh, explored the national parks up into the Andes and off the Pacific coast photographing and recording plants and this is one of the things I found growing up in the high temperate rainforest where it virtually rains all day in the damp humidity. Spe real spectacular ferns and I brought a small piece of the frond back with me and left it for several months and then the spores come out from underneath the leaves and then we managed to propagate from the spores and now I have this plant. Quite rare in cultivation but it is a Beautiful big fronds on it. But what I like about it is uh, as it matures, uh, hopefully these will be one, you will see underneath this fantastic silver sheen. It's a shame it wasn't on the top, but uh, you have to search for it. But there's not any ferns that can produce that. I think it's very, so attractive. Another plant this time of year you'll find almost all over the garden actually. This is Libertia grandiflora, native to New Zealand. Um, really spectacular herbaceous plant, totally hardy. Um, it will self-seed around the garden as well, so once you've got it, you've got to keep your eye out for all the seedlings. But uh, it makes a great drift. We use it um, on the edges of borders in various parts of the garden. Here's a, another euphorbia, quite common, most gardens have got it. Euphorbia griffithii, my namesake, but fire glow. Uh, makes a running kind of set of rhizomes under the ground, so it's quite invasive, so you have to keep it under control. But as a group, it's quite effective this time of year. One of the things about the gardens is we do have a lot of wildlife and we have been breeding golden pheasants and Lady Amherst pheasants and they have the freedom of the garden to wander around. They add a bit of extra colour actually, right? <laughs> just like a plant does, it comes into season, early season, lots of colour. Then it goes into a molt and loses its feather in the middle of the, middle of the summer. A lovely uh, pink blossom up behind me is... is um, <laughs> I can't help you. <laughs> that's about to say it. Um, uh, Josie Flexer, that's it. Okay, May, May is a good month now for, for all the, the lilac trees coming out. And this one's called Lilac's Josie Flexer Bolissian. Lovely pink blossom, quite tall. And uh, probably one of the nicest of the pinks. But we have various other lilacs around the garden. Uh, we should probably have more because I think there's a good opportunity to give a big display of colour in between the flowering between the rhododendron and azaleas. They add to the combination. We're hoping to see you all back soon, maybe in a few weeks' time. Which to, we can't put a date on it, although we are opening our garden centre side soon as well, so that that's maybe within the next week or two. Um, we're hoping to get the plant sales going and uh, the gardens will be just as attractive, lots of things to see in, a, in another few weeks' time.